Jackson, New Jersey is where me and James both come from originally. James still lives here now. I've since lived in New York City and Philadelphia, but I always find myself coming back to Jackson. There's some people out to tell about a time and place we all know well and it's hard times in the time. This is sort of our home, you know, this is our fort. 20 minutes south, I mean, it even gets more desolate and you drive 20 minutes north and it gets a lot more built up. So we're kind of uh, smack dab in the middle of a lot of things right here. After years in rock, punk, and traditional folk bands, the duo Jackson Pines now plays original music inspired by their roots in the northern Pine Barrens town of Jackson. Living in Jackson, you grow up 20 minutes from the beach and about an hour either way to Philly and New York. My father was a music teacher. He was a band director in Carteret for 30 years. He was a horn player for 30, 40 years. It was a really inspiring place because I grew up with my dad going to Knicks games and seeing the New York Philharmonic practice on the afternoon. But also, we would go with the Cub Scouts and go camping in Alaire State Park and feel like we were miles away from civilization. I still enjoy that to this day, like going to a city, coming back, and hanging out in the woods for a few days. So it's a nice, nice bounce, you know? If they're not dead, they're trying to find something to fix their heads All the times in the pine. My grandpa was a welder in the Navy. He came back and opened our shop, Blackie's Weld, and that was his nickname, Blackie, Lloyd Black. And then uh, my dad took it over eventually, too. It's pretty much his fault and my mom's fault I play music. I would get off the bus in elementary school, and he always had Hank Williams Sr. playing in there, so I was like, what the heck is that? She always had cool CDs. The one CD I always put on would be uh, Johnny Cash's Greatest Hits, and that opened a lot of doors for me, even if I didn't know it at the time. A half hour from here, there's Albert Hall, and a lot of people don't know, but there actually is a, a vibrant bluegrass folk music scene in South Jersey, Central Jersey. And Albert Hall, we used to go there when I was a little kid and watch guys playing banjos and fiddles. And then I'd come back here and I'd play in a punk band with my other friends. So it's kind of like that polar opposite with music because you got bluegrass down the road and then you got a guy playing in a punk band the next street up. Me and James would listen to his record collection, which is expansive, and he introduced me to all these country singers I didn't know about. We would go off and riff about the lives of these musicians and the dream of singing songs and writing stuff and traveling the country. When I started my first folk band, Thomas Wesley Stern, we knew James was always this great bass player in these funky or punky kind of bands. My bandmate asked him, would you learn how to play stand-up bass to be in our folk band? And he said, I'll try. And he figured out how to play the darn thing. And we've been playing together for the last eight years now. We've been to England and Ireland together. We've traveled across the country multiple times. To have someone as solid and consistent as James is just something that makes me really, really lucky. And sometimes I don't know how I could do it without him. As a new band, James Black and Joe McAvecki balance recording and touring with their day jobs. For Joe, co-writing music with fledgling songwriters fits in nicely. As a working musician, I'm lucky to have a lot of different freelance jobs. One of the things I do, I get to go to Lake House Music Academy and I run song co-writing sessions with a multitude of their student body. We will either start a song from scratch or they'll come in with a song we half wrote or something they wrote at home that they are really excited about and we will sit down and we will finish that song. take those songs, bring them into the studio, which is also in the Music Academy, and they get to make albums. That's what I do, and I'm really lucky to be able to do that because making sandwiches at the corner store didn't work out as well, so I'm really happy to be able to do something that I feel like I'm actually good at. I feel so down, and I know why I just watched my man go down and die. I put his body in the river. Let sweet water take him down. Joe's songwriting is very present day, but with an old timey feel. I guess you'd call it Americana. I guess that's what it is. You know, you take day to day things like 
Joel write a song about the guy selling coffee with him this morning, the conversation they had, and he turned it into that, and it's just, it all kind of grows from there. Sweetwater really stands out to me, the imagery he put in that song and how it comes back to everyday life here. It's like a Pine Barrens novel in a song. I said, Sweetwater's gonna take them down. The cedar trees grow along the rivers in the Pine Barrens, and it stains the water this beautiful dark hue. In the 1700s, British colonials called it sweet water because it reminded them of the color of tea. It's the image of taking someone you love and laying them into a river to allow them to return to the earth. Eight years ago, I lost my father. My father was a musician his whole life. He is one of the main reasons why I could never imagine myself as anything but a musician. So I'm just taking this stuff that I've gleaned and I'm finding a way to sing about one of the more tragic moments of my life, which was losing my father, and braiding it into this language of the land, this language of the music that we love, and turning it into something that I hope other people can relate to. And I've had people come up to us and say that they've had this song played at their father's funeral, and that's the kind of stuff that keeps us going. I know sweet, but they're gonna take us all right down.